So uh, I'll give you a little bit about my background, though most of you might have already heard me. Um, I have a background in film production and also advertising and design. I've been doing this for about almost 20 years now. I've worked for NBC. I've uh, worked for different ad agencies, both in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area. And I've been, I guess, creating stories ever since uh, getting out of college. And even in college, I was already doing uh, video and film production. I've been, uh, I've worked on two documentaries uh, myself uh, with some other friends and colleagues. And um, <coughs> one of the things that has uh, transcended across my whole career, whether I've been doing film or video or uh, design, is that it all comes down to really telling your story. Uh, everything else is just really a different type of tool. Film, video, print, websites, and then now social media is a very big uh, part of our everyday communication. Uh, and as I mentioned in my last one about Facebook, the most important thing is that every touch point that you utilize, whether it's video, film, or digital communication, you want it to work together. Uh, you don't want to say one thing or do something on the digital spectrum and then do something totally different in print. Part of uh, integrated branding and integrated communication is that each piece uh, acts like um, building equity or diminishing equity. And what I mean by equity is just like uh, when you buy a house, uh, you have home equity, right? So you buy a house and you hope that equity builds up over time. Um, and it's the same in branding and communication, is that you want uh, the equity of what you say to build. And at every touch point, you have this opportunity to either diminish your equity or improve your equity or have no effect. And you always want to build upon that. So uh, one of the things is, is if you don't have an integrated solution or an integrated plan in your communication, what ends up happening is at those touch points that you don't uh, build your equity is you diminish it and you diminish your brand. Uh, and in diminishing your brand, then it makes it that much harder to build back that trust, build back that confidence. Uh, so again, always keep in mind, regardless of the touch point that you're working on, is always to try to improve and add to the brand equity that people have in your organization. Um, so here's today's agenda. Know your audience. In telling a story at any time, again, at any touch point, this is the most important thing that I can impart on you, is know your audience, or know the audience that you're trying to reach. And don't pick an audience that's so broad that it doesn't have any differential uh, to what anybody else can achieve. In other words, don't say all males and females between the ages of 8 and 80. That's not helpful in your pursuit to make a targeted <laughs> message and to be able to tell your story, effective, story effectively. Uh, what you want to do is really know your audience, or at least if you can't, you know, we're all time constraint and resource constraints, so I don't expect you guys to be able to go out and do a survey of the people, but if you could do it, I would highly suggest learn as much as you can about the people that you're trying to convince in order to listen to your story. Because this way, even if you have to make a hypothesis based on maybe limited information, that's better than just saying, well, I just want to talk to everybody and anybody. Um, so really know your audience. Write a script. Now, this is more specific to video and film. But definitely write a script, and I don't mean you have to write dialogue, I don't mean you have to go out and hire a script writer. Uh, what I would like you to do when I say write a script is I want you to think about your audience, think about what is the most compelling thing you can tell somebody. Just as if you were in the elevator, I don't know if you've heard, you know, oh, everybody in the nonprofit should have an elevator speech or an elevator pitch, meaning that you have this concise story and concise facts that you can tell somebody in the amount of time that someone would ride in a short elevator. And so write a script. Take assumptions about your target audience and then write that message that would speak to that audience and engage them. Next, organize your content. This will make your life so much better when you're trying to attack a, in a video project or produce a video, is organize your content, whether it's photographs, video clips, audio sound, uh, maybe some uh, PSAs that you, you've developed for your organization in the past. 
but find those elements and organize them. Don't, and then see if it kind of fits where you're going with the script. Because sometimes the content, and again, because we're all limited in our resources, sometimes the content will drive how your script might develop so you don't have to start from ground zero. Shooting your video, that will be the, uh, another part of our, my presentation, and then editing your footage. So know your audience. Who is your primary audience? The age, their gender, interests, income, again, any prejudice that you might know that they may or may not have about you and your organization. Just know that and, at, and, and think about that because that helps you frame how you're gonna tell your story. What is the core message and identify your key takeaway. Again, going back to that elevator pitch, know what the key takeaway is that you would want that person to know after stepping out of the elevator and meeting you. And then the call to action, specifically for this event, it's SV Gives. How is SV Gives and your participation in this 24 hour giving day event, how is it gonna benefit you? How can your donors, your potential donors, uh, make the greatest impact for your organization. Writing the script. Keep your story simple. Again, back to the elevator pitch. You can't overwhelm them with statistics or big long stories that you can't get done within a short amount of time. Especially when it comes to YouTube. How many people have gone to YouTube and tried to watch videos that are on there? Just show of hands. So we've all been to YouTube. How many people will actually watch a video longer than five minutes? How many people watch a video longer than 10 minutes? So you can see right there from that quick survey, nobody's going to watch a 10 minute video unless it's the most compelling, engaging, video that's ever been produced. Because even if it was a full length movie that's already been in the theaters, you would have a hard time getting a person to watch YouTube to watch that piece of uh, art. So think about that. Don't go over five minutes. I highly suggest don't go over three minutes. So there's kind of a parameter for you. Sometimes it's very hard to get to three minutes. But then again, that's why you want to write a script and really target your audience because the more targeted you are, the more honed your uh, pitch will be, and the tighter your story will be, which will allow you to keep your story simple. Present the problem, and this is the problem that you solve. Because after you present this problem, there should almost be an immediate thing leading the user or the, the viewer down the path that you and your organization solve the problem that you present. Show how you help and solve this problem in a quick, easy di to digest manner. And that could be a, co a, a combination of photographs and video and audio. It could be uh, slides in addition to the video itself. Again, think about how best can I communicate how I solved the problem that I just presented in the fastest, quickest, easiest to digest manner. And then how will you benefit from SV Gives? Again, because this is a specific event, this allows you to really give a quick call to action of how a potential donor can help you in this giving day. And here's an example that I want to show you. And you'll have to bear with me because the internet is a little bit slow. <coughs> I knew all I could hear her say was that you know, my baby was going to die, and um, I, I could not accept that. So in my mind, I was like, you know what? There's probably nothing that you could do, but I'm going to find somebody who can help me do something. And that's where my communication with New York Presbyterian began. The tumor was located right under her neck. It was from here <laughs> and all the way around to the other side of her face. So I had to deal with that in some way, and my way of coping with that was to try to remain as detached as possible. But that was a colossal failure of itself because I couldn't remain detached. This was a child who was not supposed to live. This was a child that 
other people had given up on. Even her own mother almost gave up on her too. But here she is. What more can I say but that? So you can quickly see. So you can quickly see how you don't need fancy backgrounds. You don't need a fancy set. You don't need fancy lighting. You don't even need color. That one was in black and white. And so, but she had a story. Presbyterian Hospital honed in on a story which presented their problem in a very simple manner and presented the solution to the problem that they told you about. And it's a compelling story and it's a, it's a very uh, engaging story because how can you not listen to this mother's story telling about how Presbyterian helped her in giving birth to her child? And here's another example. So you can see that both examples, I chose these two mainly because there's no background, it's not fancy lighting, it's single camera, they use still photos, which I think all of us have access to, and then they had a very simple, concise message. And the reason that both these organizations exist, they told their story in a very simple manner. Now both of these stories don't necessarily talk to a huge audience, but broad enough in which to communicate the idea and that the halo effect around their primary target obviously would get the message in either stories. And then in the Salvation Army example, you can see that uh, you don't need you know, the most heart-tugging, uh, energetic story possible if you can get sound bites from multiple people that can tell your organization's story and the impact you guys have on the community in which you serve. Does anybody have any questions about either video? Yes. Do the people in the interviews have to match the age of the people that you're trying to target? Is that best or? No, not at all. And um, I would say that it's really the content mm -hmm. of their story. So, um, and, and what the problem that you, that your organization solves. I would go to that core uh, the core impact that you have on the community, and then try to find those stories that exemplify your impact on that community. Does that make sense? And so it could be the people that's in front of the camera could be whatever age and come from whatever background. So if you have a wider population, is it true like in print ads where they say to put children in animals? <laughs> I mean, yes, plain cats and dogs and puppies are obviously going to be very engaging, but again, they may not exemplify what your, what your organization's impact is. And so I wouldn't use gimmicks uh, in order to engage your audience. Really try to find that key takeaway again uh, that exemplifies the impact. Because that way, the story's not going to come off flippant or it, it, it's going to be interpret, interpreted appropriately. Um, by using gimmicks to kind of bring in the heartstrings. And I'm, I'm just going to throw out an example that I think everyone in this room uh, is probably familiar with, but I don't, and I'm not being disparaging at all about the organization, but uh, the uh, Christian Children's Fund. How many people have seen that commercial on television? So that one is a very engaging example 
Uh, and if those of you don't know the Christian Children's Fund, but it, it used to be Sally Fields, I think. And you would see her walking in a very desolate area, in a very uh, a, a, a challenged community. And you'd see kids playing in the dirt or whatever, and then she would tell you something about like, oh, only for the, co uh, the cost of one coffee a day, you could change this child's life and, and so forth. So it's a very engaging commercial. And I'm, I'm sure it's very effective because they've been running it probably since the 70s. Um, but I would say in today's age that that type of maybe over the top uh, isn't necessary. I think there's ways that you could tell that same story uh, about the impact that the Christian Children's Fund has on the community and do it in a manner that's not so over the top. But I can, again, I can see how uh, that could be very effective because, I mean, it's jarring. It's, it's like you're sitting there and you've got your Starbucks coffee in your hand and you're like, oh my, oh my God, I need to give. You know, put this coffee down and I'm going to give now. Um, but again, I, I think there's ways that you can do it a little bit more subtle. And, and that, that, again, is going to be up to you guys to choose the appropriateness of how you want to tell your story and your message. If that's the only way and that's the most effective way, then again, I you know, advertising does it every day, right? They put women and cars and stuff in their commercials all the time because it's sex sells, but that's not appropriate for everybody. So I I would highly recommend that you choose the appropriate uh, content in which to tell your story. What equipment should I use? Again, going back to both the Salvation Army and the Presbyterian, you don't need fancy equipment to produce either of those videos. It's, uh, it's very easy to produce either of those videos on a very limited uh, equipment budget. Even today, right now, we're shooting uh, with a DSLR camera in the back, and we actually have a little camcorder, if you notice, up on the uh, tripod back there for the wide-angle shot. Now. Um, if you can't get a hold you know, of a DSLR camera similar to this or something of a, a higher quality, again, most of your distribution, hopefully, unless you guys have big budgets that I don't know about, most of your distribution is going to be through YouTube. So again, the resolution doesn't have to be very high. You could use a camera that's 10 years old you know, that you bought you know, for the birth of your child or something, and it would still be just a good, en it would still be good enough in order to do a YouTube video. So don't worry about spending a lot of money or renting very expensive equipment. Yes? Quick question. Um, I noticed in both those videos, the audio was all the way through. Yes. And even though it showed video slide, video slide, that kind of thing, the audio went all the way through. So that's kind of the tricky part of getting good quality up. What would you recommend to you? OK, yeah, yeah, right here. Um, what audio assets do I need? Now this is the, what makes the difference between a good video and a bad video. Most people don't pay attention to the audio. When I go out to a shoot, whether it's here or somewhere else, I actually close my eyes first and I listen to the room that I'm going to shoot in. I listen for, like I hear a little bit of a hum right now, uh, which is probably the air conditioning. I listen for uh, computer fan noise. So make sure that you listen to where you're going to shoot. And if you're going to shoot outside, know that you're going to have challenges. If you're going to shoot outside, like right here we have this overpass, it would be a very challenging shoot to shoot out near this parking lot. And then we have the train track, so you're going to have to deal with the train, you're going to have to deal with the car noise. Make sure that your audio is good, because that makes the big difference between a home video that you just shoot on your own or a good video, or at least a decent video that someone's not going to have a challenge to listen to or, 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 or view. What images will engage your audience? Again, going back to the idea that you could use video and slides and uh, photographs to tell that story. Because, you know, obviously video is going to be more expensive, more challenging to capture, but you can, uh, you can utilize it, what we call it what's called B-roll, is to uh, augment the video that you shoot, you could use photographs as your B-roll to kind of 
tell more of your story, but not have to go through the expense or the resources to capture that on video. It could be more effective, obviously, but uh, again, it, it's not necessary in order to tell a good story. Yes? Can we go back to the audio aspects and flesh that out a little bit about what do, what do we need? Well, I would suggest um, for most shoots, I would suggest if you can afford to rent a decent microphone, which isn't very expensive. I mean, you can find audio video places that are probably rent it for like maybe $25, $30 a day, maybe less, uh, especially since we're all 501Cs. Um, I would definitely, if you're gonna need to rent something, a good microphone is key. And a good microphone meaning like right here, we have a, a, an example of a shotgun mic, which is a, a, a microphone that really targets uh, where you point it. That way you get the clean audio from the person that you have in front of the camera. Using a microphone similar to this is called an Omnimic, so it picks up sound in a very wide and broad uh, spectrum. So it's going to pick up any side noise, any fan noise, uh, where a shotgun mic, if you point it at the person directly, uh, typically you'll get pretty clean sound. Does that answer your question? There is another question back here. Um, how many seconds should you have the picture in the video? How many seconds? Because sometimes you watch those things and they're flipping through the photos so fast you can't really see what's you mean happening. Like still pictures? Yes, when you're inserting photos. Oh, you're when you're inserting photos, I would give it at least two and a half, three seconds. Uh, for a photo. Um, and again, it depends on what type of pacing and cadence you have in telling your story. You know, if the, if the people that you interview on camera that are telling your story are speaking quickly, you don't want to drag the video down by having a, a long pause on a, a photo. So keep that in mind and keep the pacing appropriately to the cadence that you want to tell. But if you want to emphasize something and you want the viewer to really take note of a, either a slide that has words on it or um, a photograph, then you can leave it on longer, but do it for emphasis, just like you would in, uh, in writing something, punctuation, but you want to use the punctuation appropriately. You don't want to overuse your exclamation points, you don't want to overuse ellipses or semicolons or any of that. So think about the way you pace and create cadence uh, within your video. Because again, you don't want to bore somebody. Yes? Um, sorry, back to audio. Oh, uh -huh. uh, someone mentioned to me that you could probably use your, your iPhone to record the sound. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? You can, but again, the microphone on our iPhones is going to be very broad, so it's going to pick up a lot of unwanted noise. Uh, yes? Uh, kind of along with her question, um, for equipment to shoot the, the video, I've seen actually, uh, when I went to uh, Macworld, the last Macworld, I actually saw some very good iPhone videos that people shot with their iPhone, but they had all these other attachments to it. They had a little lens attachment, and they had a microphone attachment. So I think it's possible to shoot with an iPhone and get, again, quality uh, good enough for YouTube distribution. But if you can find even an old camcorder that's five or six years old, I think the quality that you could capture using that older camera, you're going to have more control, which will, in the end, produce a better video. And then going back to the audio question by using your iPhone for audio, even if it were clean audio that you captured, the difficulty is that is then you're going to have to go to the old style, what they call the clapboard, in order to sync your audio with your picture. And I don't know if you guys know what clapboards are, but you know there, there's, there's these boards that have this little bar, and what you would do is you'd put it in front of the lens and you'd say, scene 82, take one, clap. And so that way the visual, when the two sticks clap each other, you would match that clap sound to your video when you're editing. Now, that's kind of a tedious process to use a clapboard uh, to shoot today because you'd be better off just getting an older camera that has a mic attached to it so that the audio and the video are synced already. Uh, yes? So using uh, background music, do you recommend any free online resources? Ah, free resources. That's kind of tough because uh, um, when it comes to stock audio now, there's very low-cost 
alternatives, and I don't know the name offhand, but I could, if you email me, I could send it to you. Um, but what's happened is, just like in the stock photography world, there's these uh, conglomerates that are buying up all the stock audio and all the stock uh, video and stock ph photographs. So there's really not a lot of free resources out there. And I would highly suggest don't Google things and just start pulling things off the, the internet because if someone does catch you, there's fines attached to that type of stuff. Yes? So I just wanted to add a footnote to that. <coughs> if it's in public domain, you're probably safer, but you still need to check um, where, for instance, Happy Birthday is in public domain, but there's popular songs right now that you might want to use that aren't in the public domain. Yes. So you would really get yourself into trouble if you were trying to use something that wasn't in the public domain. And to that point again, you know, you know how you can just go on Google, type in giraffes, and there'll be, and then you click on images, and you'll see all these pictures of giraffes. Well, Google's pulling those images from everybody's website all the way around the world, but that doesn't mean you get to download it and then stick it in your video and then throw it up on YouTube. If someone catches you, again, you, you might uh, put yourself in some serious repercussions. Yes. I don't think it's 30. I think it's less than that, but I don't remember the exact uh, you repeat number the question, seconds. Please? Oh, she was asking that, she was saying that she had heard that you could use up to 30 seconds of audio, uh, a, a music clip, say for instance, and if you used 25 seconds and you didn't go up to the 30 mark, that you'd be able to use it without any repercussions. I don't think that's a true statement, actually. Yes? So, um, I make a published songwriter for Nashville, and the, the legal limit is two measures, musical measures of music or whatever that you can use without violating the copyright law. So that's why you might hear something, a very, very short riff or something that might trigger you to remember maybe the Olympics or something, but if you use more than two measures, then you're violating the copyright law. Yeah. And in most songs, two measures is not going to be uh -huh. anywhere close to what you seconds. Need, right. It's probably like two seconds. Yes? If on your video you want to, um, as this gentleman suggested, go from still photo to video to still photo and flip back and forth, how do you then have, the only thing I can think of is voiceover, and I have no clue of how you would do that, but so if you want to have a continuous audio running, when you go from still to video, how do you sync that? No, you can actually, the way it was done, and those are called audio bridges, is that they just laid down the audio first without laying down the video. Okay. So most editing softwares um, allow you to put in the audio and the picture together at the same time, or you can unclick audio and then it will just lay down the video, or you could do vice versa, you could click on video and unclick audio and it will allow you to lay down the video without the audio. So, um, and then you can always splice in the audio after the fact, because most, again, uh, editing softwares out there allow you to add multiple tracks. So you, you have your left channel, your right channel, and then you can have additional tracks that you can add audio in even after uh, you've already laid down, say, three or four tracks. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. I actually haven't seen that. I've seen similar things, like um, I think even iMovie has a lot of these transitional things where you throw in a bunch of photos or videos, and then it automatically has this uh, already pre-programmed transitions, which allows you to zoom out and zoom in, or even Facebook just put out a, a, a recent app where you just click on it, and it takes all your photos from out of your timeline, and it puts this in a mosaic, and then it, it zooms out, and then you see all these pictures, and then it will zoom in on one, and then it zooms out, and then it flips around, and then it zooms back in. Um, there's a lot of these uh, pre-made transitions that are in a lot of the, uh, 
different uh, video editing software. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Janet Davis, and I'm with the Crowd Center for Innovation at Toyo College. And just listening to your questions, just thought I'd let you know that I'm teaching a workshop on all of this. It's all hands-on, and it's going to be Saturday, March the 1st. If you want to go to Toyo College's website and look for the Crowd Center for Innovation link, you'll be able to take a workshop that will, that will teach you how to do all of these things. Just in a, sh in a short few hours, but it's all hands-on. So if you'd like to you know, participate, it, that sort of thing is a community college crisis. So it's very, very expensive. Yes. If you're using iMovie, the um, audio clips they have included in that, is are those uh, available to use as background? Uh, you know, that I'm not yes. sure. I think you could use it, and because you're a nonprofit and you're not selling it and you're not using it in a manner in which you're going to generate direct funds from, I think you can use it. Okay, look at the terms and conditions. You could do that. But actually, I did, uh, I think there's one, though, I thought I read an article. I think there's a Randy Newman song in the iMovie, and you, I don't think he does allow for that. It, if, if it's your own personal use, but it's not available to use in a corporation video, or it might not even be available to use in a uh, nonprofit organization. Yes? For video, would you recommend going to 1080p uh, maximum quality, or like something less or smaller than that? I highly recommend shooting 1080p, only for the reason that even though you're only going to mostly use it for uh, YouTube, I mean, YouTube does uh, broadcast uh, 1080p. Uh, but I would do it because if you wanted to distribute that in some other form, let's say I don't know, you wanted to burn it to DVD and send it out in some kind of press package, uh, if you don't, if you haven't shot it in 1080p, then it's going to get really grainy when you download it to a DVD and then they put put it in their DVD or Blu-ray player at home and then they play it. It's going to look very grainy. Yeah, just follow up. So, do you think widescreen is better than uh, like four by three uh, ratio? I think so, because even if the person doesn't have a widescreen television, um, it will still play, but you know some things are obviously going to get cut off. If you know your audience possibly doesn't have, or majority of your audience possibly doesn't have uh, a widescreen television set, then what you can do is when you shoot it in 1080p or 16 by 9 format, which is kind of the wider format, just make sure that when you're shooting it, you just keep it within four by three safe. You know what I mean? Um, keep all the things that are very pertinent to your story within your four by three frame. Yes. Um, do you, could you give us a resource on how to use the best lighting in the one thing, or what is recommended lighting? Is just like research? Yeah, actually, I was going to get to that. So uh, let me get to this next, and I'll definitely get to that. I was uh, going to say the other one would have been like an audio filter, you know, like to filter out noise. There are, uh, but I don't know how readily available there are unless you're using like Premiere or Final Cut. In Premiere and Final Cut, both of them have a lot of different types of apps or uh, uh plugins that you can add to either uh, editing software, and it does have a lot of that. But again, I always believe get the best audio and video at the time that you're shooting it so that you don't have to use those types of apps. Some of those apps actually are very good at filtering out noise and so, uh, and so forth, but it's so much better if you can just think about your audio when you're shooting it. Uh, ahead of time, so you don't run into having to re uh, resort to one of those apps or plugins. Um, create a storyboard. Uh, does everybody here know what a storyboard is? And again, I'm not suggesting that you go hire a storyboard artist. You, uh, what I'm suggesting is that once you've written your script, you've narrowed down your key takeaways, that at least you chicken scratch out. Like, I can't draw for my life. I mean, literally, I just use, uh, I just use stick figures. But what it does is it, it puts me in, in the, the viewer's mind of what they're going to see. So even though my stick drawing is completely useless to try to communicate to somebody else what I'm trying to shoot, at least I know myself of how I'm organizing my shots ahead of time. 
And again, keeping yourself organized in pre-production versus production, it will save you so much heartache uh, in the end before you get into editing. So shooting your video, again, listen. That's so key. Listen to the room, listen to the sounds, like there goes the train. Listen to those things so you know the limitations of where you're shooting and what you're shooting. Natural light can be your best friend. So when it comes to lighting, when you're on a limited budget, try to use natural light. Look for places that have a lot of natural light, windows, uh, quiet places outdoors that you're not going to run into the train or car noise. Um, but I would highly suggest using natural light. Natural light for a lot of reasons is one, it's full spectrum light. So it has all the colors in the world that the eye can see. Two, as long as it's not direct high noon sunlight, direct light, if you get in a shaded area where there's indirect light, it makes nice colors for your subject matter's face, it makes them look natural. They don't look washed out because you're using some kind of really harsh light or white light. Um, so I would highly suggest when you can, use natural light. When you can't use natural light, do you have to go out and rent a big lighting package? No. I think, I mean, you can get away with like two incandescent lights on some string, and then I would just highly suggest putting some kind of diffuser in front of it, so it's not a big 100 watt light bulb uh, in front of someone's face. But if you put 200 watt light bulbs hanging on a string, and then I strung just even a white sheet to diffuse the light, um, you're gonna have a nice, evenly lit person uh, that doesn't have harsh shadows or make them look scary. Uh, so you don't have to have a lot of uh, expensive equipment in order to get nice lighting. But I would highly suggest that you use things that diffuse light, that make things uh, softer. If you're going to shoot under these types of lights, these fluorescents, your subject matter is going to be relatively blue a lot of times, or it's going to have these kind of like dark circles around their eyes. So if you have to shoot in this, you need to what's called white balancing. And I don't know, does everyone in this room know what a white balancing is? There's this little button on most video cameras that you can press, and you, what you do is you hold up like a white piece of paper, uh, away from the lens, and then you push the button for the white balance, and then what it does is it allows the camera to um, calibrate the colors according to the whiteness of the sheet. So that way, your subject matter, even if I shot under these uh, fluorescent lights, your subject matter's skin tones would still look natural. Uh, but I highly suggest not using fluorescent lighting if you can get away with it. The one good thing about fluorescent lighting, though, is it is very soft and it's very even. But in order to control the color, again, you're going to have to remember to white balance. And then on the back end, they're still going to have a little bit of stuff that you might have to try to clean up in post-production using your editing software and then working within those tools to color correct it. Practice makes perfect. Take as many takes as it takes. So for this particular uh, um, project uh, for SD Gives, I would suggest that you're not shooting a documentary. So you don't have to just sit there and wait for your subject matter to come up with the best sound bite possible. You have the ability, through post-production, to edit that story. So if you want to feed your subject matter, not dialogue, I'm not suggesting that you feed them dialogue, but if you feed your subject matter you know, questions and you prompt them to get the type of sound bite you're looking for in order to exemplify your story, I would highly suggest doing that. And take as much practice as you want. You can say to your subject, okay, I'm gonna ask you this question, tell them the question, I want you to think about it, don't tell me your answer yet. Turn on the camera, start rolling, and then ask them the question. And then by then, hopefully you've given your subject time to process your question in their own mind and through their own words, and then to tell you their story, which hopefully, again, goes back to the key takeaways that uh, you want them to say. And then stay organized, log sheets and EDLs. EDLs, that's an edit decision list, mostly used for post-production. Log sheets is what you use while you're shooting. And basically all it is is it could just be a regular notebook paper, and what you want to write down 
How many people know what time code is? Anyone? <coughs> so there's a few people. Uh, you would write the time code or the counter numbers. So most video cameras have counter numbers or time code. Most newer cameras nowadays all you have time code. So that's the exact second and frame that is being laid down at the time that you looked at it. And what you want to do with your log sheets, again, by staying organized, say that, oh, I interviewed Ian and from you know, 00105000, Ian said something really great about this. So when I'm shooting, I write down the time code, I write down a, a really brief uh, note of what was said, and then when that edit was done, or when that sound bite was done. Because that way, it will save you so much time when you get all done shooting, and now you go into editing. If you haven't done your log sheets, oh, then what do you have to do? You have to watch all the raw footage again, from start to finish. And then you have to decide, oh god, what was I trying to do? And again, going back to your script, if you have your thing scripted out, and you have your... Um, you have your storyboard. Again, I would keep everything organized and notated so that you know, oh, when I interviewed Ian, I was expecting Ian's clip to go here in my storyboard, and he was going to say this for this video in this particular spot. Keep yourself organized. It will save you so much heartache and headaches uh, in post-production. Edit your footage. Pay close attention to the audio. Again, what I do, as soon as I go, I look at my log sheet, I start my edit decision list. So again, it's just another 8 half by 11 paper with lines on it. I go to my log sheets, I go directly to that clip, and I look for that clip where Ian said blah, blah, blah. And then I first, before even looking at the video, I play that clip from where I notated, and I just listen to it. Do I hear any weird noise? Was the train in the background? Did I hear coughing? You know, did someone's phone go off? Hopefully not, and hopefully, again, you are paying attention to the audio in the front half when you were shooting it so that there isn't that, and you don't get that surprise. But every once in a while, you're going to get that surprise, and you're going to go, oh, God, that phone went off right when Ian was saying the best thing possible. Well, now you have a problem. So now you're going to have to figure out a way, can I get the best of what Ian said and clip around that phone going off or the train going by or the the car honking, and hopefully there's a way to do it, and then you can go to a slide, you can go to a picture, and again, you can utilize that B-roll and cut away from Ian, and then still tell your story, and not have the phone or the car or the train in the background going off, because that's distracting. What it does is it disengages your viewer, because your viewer is engaged in what you know, Ian might have been saying, but now all of a sudden the phone goes off in the background and you're like, oh, and then it kind of disrupts them from being engaged in what's being, what's being shown on the screen. Stay on point. Again, if you're doing your log sheets while you were shooting and you have a script and you have a, a, a storyboard, this will keep you on point and that you won't lead your viewer astray by getting distracted about some other great soundbite that might be good for some other video down the line, but not the video that you originally intended to produce in the first place. Again, that's the point of uh, doing a script, even though, again, you're not writing dialogue, but at least it keeps you on track uh, so that the video that you plan to uh, produce is the video that you end up producing. Ask yourself, for every shot that you do, and again, this is going back to the storyboard, is that every shot, do you really need that shot? If you don't, I highly suggest take it out. Because you want to keep your story tight, you want to keep it concise, and you want to stay under that three minute mark if possible. Adding music to enhance, not distract. So it's very easy to go, oh, I love this song, I want it, I think it'd be really great, it, it would really create drama in my video. I would use music sparingly and only to enhance whatever is being said or communicated through your audio and your video or through your slides or your pictures. I don't suggest adding music just to add music's sake or to try to keep the tempo high or, or, or whatever it is. I would try to keep your music um, really just as, a, as an accent to whatever it is you're trying to show. 
Okay, now we are open for questions. Yes. You've referenced several times uh, video editing software. Can you mm -hmm. name some of those or some of the online services? Yes. Uh, I particularly like Final Cut Pro, but it's expensive and it's um, but it's the standard in the industry. Uh, Final Cut Pro. But um, there's Premiere, which is made by uh, Adobe. Uh, that's another great one. I mean, you can do everything from your home videos all the way up to professional movies or television shows. Um, iMovie, for those of you who have Macintoshes, uh, basically comes with iMovie, so it's free. Uh, I don't think Apple's allowed that to be downloaded for PCs, but I'm not sure. I'm actually a Mac person, so um, I'm not sure if that's free for uh, PC users. Um, but I think, does it, oh, someone probably in this room is a Windows person. Uh, does Windows come with a, an no, editing? Yeah, it comes with a free media. Oh, do you, what, what is it called, the editor? Um, Windows, Windows Movie Maker. Yeah. Windows Movie Maker. So, I mean, yeah, so uh, they say it's excellent. Um, and again, I've never used it. But uh, iMovie is very capable. Again, iMovie, you could have done either the Presbyterian or the, uh, the um, Salvation Army video using <coughs> iMovie, or I'm sure it would have been able to use it on the Windows. Okay. Yes? Hi, this, this question may be obvious, but in the two videos you showed, mm -hmm. I didn't hear a specific call to action. I heard, I learned about an agency who maybe worked with these individuals. Mm -hmm. But high in Silicon Valley Lake is a little different. Mm -hmm. This is an fundraising event mm -hmm. rather than a video about your organization. So what do you suggest? Um, in order to tie it back to SV Gives, I think it actually might be a little bit easier. Both of those videos are more brand awareness right, videos. Right. The Salvation Army did have a call to action, but it's very subtle, right? It's just the little bucket at the end oh, saying, you know, yeah. your holiday donations, da da da. So it automatically leads you back. It's a call to action, and it tells you, hey, the way this story came about was because you put money in this little bucket, right? So it was a very subtle call to action. I think for an event like SV Gives, you can be more overt. You can be more direct and say, look it, give on this day, on May 6th, and help me help these people, right? You can just be straight up, because it's a 24-hour event on a specific day. It's not an evergreen video that's gonna be good for the whole year, and you can just show it. No, it's only gonna be good until May 6th. So I highly suggest utilize that, what we would call sense of urgency, uh, to get your donors or your potential donors to give on this specific day. And even more so, if you guys picked up the prize sheets, uh, and again, I would highly suggest that you go to uh, svgives.org, because we're updating the prizes every day, and uh, it seems like more and more corporations and individual donors are adding more and more prizes. So I highly suggest go there, Find which is the best thing for you, and maybe there's multiple times during that 24-hour event that you could get your potential donors to give on a specific time that will magnify their donations towards your organization. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes. I had a comment. I said that Flat Multimedia class at San Jose State recently, and my teacher said, because I didn't have Mac music, I told everybody to use my movie, but I couldn't. And mm -hmm. So I was told about that movie. Well, it's not um, a professional editing software, but again, the two examples, you could have done it in either iMovie or um, Movie Maker, or whatever it's called, uh, because they're basically just straight cuts and straight transitions. There was nothing fancy, there was no character generated stuff in those. Uh, and that's the one. Yeah, the sound um, tools like in iMovie are not the best. They're better than they used to be. In fact, the latest iMovie uh, that I've seen actually has nice audio control. You can control the levels. You can bring them in and out. It has automatically dampening uh, filters and stuff like that. But um, So it's a lot better than it used to be. But in comparison to Premiere or Final Cut, yeah, you don't have the same control and tools that you have in those two softwares. Yes? How long do you think it should take to make a video like 
uh, for a one minute video, like the two examples, um, how long? Are you talking about from the time you write the script to the time it goes up on YouTube? I'm thinking, uh, since we, nonprofits very limited resources, and it's probably, you know, one person department's working on these things. Mm -hmm. um, editing, shooting, that, that kind of time commitment. I think it's really going to depend on your content. Say, for instance, uh, what is your organization? Cyrus. And what is the impact you have on the community? Uh, we provide resources. Okay, so I'm sure you've helped uh, numerous immigrants in Santa Clara County. I would first think about what and who is the best person that I have helped that exemplifies what our organization does. And then think about that person and think about the content that you would need to capture and tell that story within less than three minutes. And from there, once you write your script and you do your little storyboard, I think from start to finish, for a three minute piece, I bet you, you know, not knowing the stories that you could come up with, I think you could probably do it in about a week, maybe less. Really depends on who you choose, how easy accessible, uh, but if you knew like, oh, I could get them tomorrow and put the camera in front of them and blah, 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 I think you could probably get it done in a week or less. If you were to, you know, focus on that, many of us, you know, we're wearing multiple hats and we're bouncing from one project to another. But if you were to focus on it, I think you could get it done in less than a week. Yes. Uh, any recommendations for creating our YouTube channel? Creating your YouTube channel. Um, the main video. You know how when you go to YouTube and you go to your page and the one video comes up immediately. Uh, that main video, your hero video, I would make for sure that that is the most concise, it has your best elevator pitch in that position. Because when someone types in your organization's name or they've gone to your website and then they've gone to your YouTube channel, um, immediately that one, that one video automatically queues up. So that hero position, I highly recommend that that's your best elevator pitch video in that position. And then do use the playlist. So if you go to your YouTube channel, you'll notice that you can create playlists. There's most recents, and then you can create your own playlists. You know, again, you want to present your organization, uh, especially through that medium and that touch point of YouTube, you want to present it in a manner that tells the most compelling story in the quickest fashion possible. Yes? So that's going to be your hero video. How often should you update that or change it? Well, that's a good question. We haven't changed ours very often. We've been actually time constrained uh, at the foundation ourselves, and we have limited resources. So our video, that's our hero, has probably been up way too long. I would highly suggest that that video, the hero video, could switch out at least once a quarter, if you can afford to do that. You know, once every four months or so, or if you can't, at least you know, once or twice a year would be. Uh, the minimum, even though we're probably guilty of that ourselves of not doing that. Yes? Just to let you know, at Foothill College at the Cross Center for Innovation, <coughs> we have, um, we can give you access to the software that you need. All of our computers in our lab have installed Final Cut Pro, Premiere, and some of, <coughs> and all of those things. So if you want to use that as a resource, it's available for you, and it's for free for the community. Oh, that's great. Cool. What's yes. your name? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stay here if you want to ask me any questions. Okay, good, Janet. Thanks. Yes. Uh, when you're speaking about target audience, is it possible to produce a video with a wide range of target audience? Do you suggest breaking that down into like three videos? Uh, like, you know, there are situations when your audience is broad mm -hmm. and a general message can reach that target. If you can, I highly suggest breaking it up into multiple uh, targeted audiences, especially if it crosses either gender lines or age, you know, definitive age groups, you know, XYs versus X, you know, X gens or whatever. I would highly suggest that, I, I would prefer that you would break up those audiences so that you can make the appropriate audience. Because normally when you have definitive age group differentials or gender differentials, then normally the channels in which you direct 
or pull that audience to see that video. Normally, you could be more targeted to bring them to that video or push out that video to a targeted audience. That way, it makes it more appropriate that you're not just shotgunning uh, your audience. And I highly suggest always hunt with a narrow range rifle and not do the shotgun method. I think a more targeted method, you'll get better results. Yes? So in terms of the hero video back again, if you have multiple targets, for the hero video on YouTube, that's people coming to your um, channel, probably through the means of your website, or you maybe you've pushed out some communication that that uh, draws them to specifically to the YouTube. Again, you're going to have to be probably more broad in that sense for that particular video. But then again, if you make playlists that maybe speak to different audiences, you could divide up your audiences that way. And then that way the hero video could be a little bit more broader, but that you have other videos that are a bit more targeted. That way they stay on your, your YouTube channel longer. Yes? Um, if you're really resource tra strapped, um, you, you very much have focused on an actual video. Could you also have as, as good or, or as decent of an impact if you just did speaking audio to tell the story with very impactful photos? I think you can. I think it's, um, it's more challenging. Uh, I think it can be just as effective, but using stills and then just using slides. I mean, I've seen great slideshow presentations, and I'm sure many of you in this room have probably seen great slideshows with no video and all it is is still pictures with you know copy either superimposed on top or title slides uh, used like in the Presbyterian. I think it can be very effective. I think it is more challenging though because I think naturally uh, we as human beings kind of gravitate to video and moving pictures and you know that's why people watch television than they do probably listen to the radio. Yes. I'm probably not going to make a video that's going to go viral. That's just reality. Um, but sending it out to our network is only so impactful. How do you have any suggestions about getting it out further besides using just social media and putting it on our wall? Like what? Yeah, I mean, I would, again, you want to use it on your website. You want to use it on your YouTube channel. You can put it on your Facebook page. I mean, I would utilize it. I always believe in create once and use often, especially in our arena of nonprofit. Um, you really want to create assets that you can use often and everywhere possible. Because that way, um, the wider and the broader and broader distribution, obviously, you're going to get better response and better results uh, in engaging those potential donors or uh, potential volunteers uh, to come to your organization. So again, always think about create once and use often. Uh, but again, I believe also that more targeted is better than shotgun. Yes? Are you familiar with Razu? I am familiar with Razu. Uh, did you have a specific question? Well, I was wondering, I know you can have different projects within your organization, within your organization, and different projects for like, uh, you know, the file, for the Could you have a video for each different thing, or would you just have one? For the Razu page, especially when it comes to SV Gives, I would highly suggest that you have one main hero video. Again, that's your best elevator pitch because that's the one that the viewer's gonna see as soon as they come to your Razu page. So that better be the best elevator pitch video possible. I highly suggest that it is a video because that way you can tell your story in a very concise, quick and engaging manner um, because what you can do in 60 seconds versus what you could say in 10 paragraphs more people uh, are going to get engaged through that 60 second uh, audio I mean video than they would you know a 10 paragraph uh, page worth of text and you can see that also on YouTube YouTube itself I mean not YouTube sorry uh, Facebook Facebook, if you just look across everyone's Facebook pages and you saw all the different posts they had and you compared the posts of their, the ones that they used pictures or video versus the ones where they just had a text post, I'm sure almost across the board that you had better engagement, more likes, uh, more sharing of that post than the ones that didn't have video or audio to it. Because even think about your own personal uh, Facebook profiles, 
when your friends put on pictures, you're constantly going, oh, that's a cute picture of their, their kid, or that's a cute picture of da-da-da. Oh, I like that food that my friend just posted. And you're clicking like, 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 with no deep involvement, per se, but you're going to get those engagement. Does that make sense? Yes? Are you recommending then for Razoo that we do, you said 60 seconds, are you recommending a 60 second hero video then as opposed to three minutes? I think so. Uh, but again, 60 seconds is very, it, it, I will not try to deceive you. 60 seconds is tough. You have to have an engaging story. You have to have that, oh, how can I grab them, pull them in, tell my story, and then say, hey, give on May 6th. So 60 seconds is tough, but I think if you were going to try to shoot for a goal, that would be the goal. Because anybody can watch a 60 second video. A 190 minute video, a little tougher to carry it, a little tougher to have them engage that long. But 60 seconds, most people can get engaged and watch it, whether it's effective is where the challenge is. Because you want that 60 seconds to tell my story and get the call to action in and all do it all within 60 seconds, it's tough. But again, the more time you put in your pre-production, writing your script, honing your storyboard, and throwing out the shots you don't really, really, really need, you can get, you can get there. Even if it's a minute and 30, uh, I would highly suggest that over three minutes. Is there an SD Gibbs video that we could position next to the hero video that says, and watch the SD Gibbs to discover we have not created that yet, but we are working on it. Actually, uh, thanks to the generosity of uh, Microsoft and their uh, marketing team, their multimedia team, we are going to be putting together a, actually, I think it's going to be a 90. We're, I think, well, we're, I think we're going to shoot a 90, but we're going to break it down into a 60 also, which will be basically an abbreviated version of a 90. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you recommend using title slides or having a second voice? I think whatever is the most effective. And I would try it both ways. because, uh, And then show it to people in your office and see, hey, which, which do you think is better? I mean, even just getting feedback from just 10 people, it can be very valuable to you. It's like, which, you know, watch this one. OK. Stop, pause. Watch this one, they watch it, and then ask them, which one did you like better? And then show 10 people. You might get 10 different answers. I'm not going to say that they're going to gravitate to one in a majority or not. But hopefully, there will be some differential that people will gravitate to one or the other. Um, adding a second voice and doing voiceover and stuff, I think, again, can be effective, but it can also be distracting if it doesn't really match up well with the video that you have you know, uh, interviewers, uh, or the interviewees that you have in your piece. Um, anyone else? Yes? Just a quick one. Um, in your conversation about log sheets, you mentioned EDL. Yeah, edit decision list. So again, when you get into um, your post-production, you're going to use your log sheets to quickly get to the clips and the sound bites that you notated during your production while you were shooting. You're going to go to them, and then you're on your edit decision list your EDL, what you're going to do is you're going to find when you're editing is that you're going to you're, you're going to put it in a sequence. You're going to put the pictures and the video and the type and the title slides in a particular sequence, but that doesn't mean that that's the only sequence. Maybe you know this video that you put on the end should go in the front, and maybe the person that you put in the front should be really at the end. The reason you use a EDL is so that you can track the different versions. And I highly suggest that whatever version you come up with the first time, put that aside, watch it, test it with you know whoever you can, uh, your parents, your friends, your cousins, whoever. Get them to watch it, get, get them to give you feedback. But then put that one aside. I mean, unless everybody just claps and stands up and gives you a, a standing ovation, then just keep it and move on. But if not, then I would highly suggest putting that aside and then resequencing your video slightly different and see if that one's more effective. In my experience, 
you know, sometimes I do come up with what ends up going out on the air, but um, the first time, but sometimes I find surprises once you get into the edit suite, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I just want to see what it would look like if I put this portion up front and take the front portion and put it in the middle and, you know, and just flip it around. Sometimes you find that to be more effective. In fact, I just did a, a video uh, from one of our events called Powered by EF, and I actually ended up, the final version that's now on YouTube, I get, it, it flipped all the way around, actually, because of the way, after watching it over and over and over again, it seemed like, oh, it's more effective if I move Melanie from the back to the front and so forth, and I, I moved the people that were in the video in different slots. Um, I have a question. Okay, uh, one more question. Okay. Yes. What about getting a release form? Yes, always get a model release form. Uh, there's generic model release forms online that you can get. Um, if you can't create one of your own, or you can get one from online, just Google model release forms, and you'll find there's a whole bunch of resources. You can download one, and then take the, take the content out of that release form, and then uh, edit it to your specific organization. But I highly, 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 highly suggest you do that, because you don't want someone to come at the end and then have changed their mind and you didn't get the model release form up front and then they say, well, I don't want to be in your video. Oh, that's tough. That's really awful. So definitely. Well, thank you very much and uh, thank you for taking the time out.